Okay, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody in the auditorium, uh, you're supposed to be fully vaccinated and must wear a mask covering your mouth and nose at all times. Uh, your presence here serves as an attestation that you're fully vaccinated. If you're not, we ask you to step out and watch online. Um, so please mute, mute your cell phones, we're gonna begin. Um, Welcome to today's program of the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. I'm Anil Kashup. I'm a member of the society and I'll be moderating today's program. If you're new to us, uh, here's a little bit about humanism. Uh, the quote I'm gonna give you comes from Lloyd Moraine who served two terms as the president of the American Humanist Association, which is the umbrella organization that we belong to. And he said, humanism teaches the first thing, uh, first that there's an intrinsic inalienable value in all human beings. This is not a value that has been given to us by a, di a deity or that we hold because we have earned it. It's our birthright. At the very heart of our philosophy is a warmly genuine sense of value in every person, whatever his or her ability, however he is uh, or she is circumstanced. This can be the foundation for an invulnerable sense of self-respect. So that gives you a sense of what, what we teach here. Um, we address a wide variety of topics in the programs that we hold on Sunday mornings. These include current events, philosophy, art, sciences, ethics, just to name a few. Today's presentation is part of our ongoing programming that's related to economics. And to deliver it, we have uh, Jean-Pierre Dubay. JP is going to talk to us about his research on food deserts. JP is my colleague at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago, where he's the James M. Kiltz Distinguished Service Professor of Marketing. He's also the director of the Kiltz Center for Marketing at the Booth School, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a faculty fellow at the Marketing Science Institute. From 2008 to 2010, he was a research consultant for the Yahoo Microeconomics Research uh, group. He's also been working as a consultant with Amazon, and he actually does quite a bit of work with, with other companies. His research lies at the intersection of industrial organization and quantitative marketing. Uh, besides the research he's going to tell us about today, he also has done a number of other empirical studies analyzing topics such as the formation of consumer preferences for branded goods, price discrimination, advertising, and the role of mission information in consumer de uh, demand. This empirical focus of, is also reflected in his uh, prize uh, MBA course on pricing strategies, which is designed to teach students how to apply marketing models and analytics to develop pricing strategies in practice. So please join me in welcoming JP Dubay. All right, thanks so much for uh, giving me a chance to speak here. So. Anil described a bit the, the nature of the program and, and the mutual interest everyone has in seeing how we can use areas like economics to tackle ethical problems and problems that have a public policy type of angle. So I think we're all in agreement that the topic of the food desert it probably fits well into that niche. Um, before I say any more, I just wanted to mention this is actually based, the talk is based on a published paper. I published this a couple of years ago. It's in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. I have a host of co-authors who are economists at a bunch of schools around the country. Uh, so if you're interested in more details, just make sure you be, have the source there. I'd be delighted to answer any questions offline if anyone wants to go into a deeper dive than I get into today. So the project actually starts with an observation. This is something that is very much not in dispute in my lecture, and that is that there are a lot of health disparities in the United States. Um, I think we're all keenly aware of the growing problems associated with obesity. Um, since my angle today is economics, the economic costs associated with obesity are, you know, relatively large, depending on who you ask, anywhere between 10 to 27 percent of our medical costs. So it poses a pretty big burden on our health care system. But I think what's most striking about obesity in the U.S. is how disproportionately it's concentrated in areas of relatively low income and relatively low education. So a direct quote here from Jernowski Inspector, these are some leading authorities in the medical area on, on nutrition, have observed many times that the highest rates of obesity occur among population groups with highest poverty rates and the least education. And of course, one of the leading explanations, again, not in dispute, but one of the leading explanations for why obesity is preponderant in the United States has to do with the decisions we make about what we eat and drink, our, our, our food purchase decisions. 
And most striking are the disparities, not just in obesity rates in low-income neighborhoods, but also in the healthfulness of what people buy. So I'll, I'll give you a little more context for where these data come from in a few minutes, but for the time being, just take it face value using a representative sample of U.S. households. What I've got here is the relationship between household income in the United States and the healthfulness of the stuff that they buy in grocery markets and supermarkets. So this excludes things like restaurants and away from home consumption, but looking at the way people shop in grocery stores and supermarkets, what this graph is meant to show you is that the healthfulness of the stuff that's in your shopping cart is increasing with your income or otherwise put decreasing <laughs> with your income is that you can decreasing as your income goes down. So the lowest income households in our sample are buying stuff that's considerably less healthy. And some of you are probably wondering how to interpret this health index scale. This is from the USDA. I'll give you a little more context for that in a moment as well. For the time being, my goal though is going to be to try and understand why do we have this gap in terms of the healthfulness of what our poorest people in the US are buying and what the wealthiest people in the US are buying. So this brings me to what my real research question was in this study, which was to tackle the economics of this problem. My background's in industrial organization and how markets are formed and how things are supplied in equilibrium in these markets. So naturally the way I'm gonna ask this, this, this inequality or this this heterogeneity in how people eat, I'm gonna try and think about this as the outcome of supply and demand. So my question is, why are we seeing these differences in the healthfulness of people's purchased foods? And to what extent is this a reflection of the supply side? Where the supply side would mean, well, what's available? You know, and how much does it cost? How do prices and, and prices and the stuff that's on the shelf contributing to those, those differences in what people buy? But I'm also going to look at this through the lens of the demand side. Because after all, people are the masters of their own purchases. They decide where to shop and what to get. So to what extent do these differences potentially also reflect people's preferences or differences in preferences and the amount of information they have about their foods? Public policy has asked this question for a long time and at least 20 years ago has already honed in on an answer. People in all the way up to the White House, including Michelle Obama, who was a very big proponent of trying to solve um, nutritional inequality, the supply side story has already been taken as a given. Um, some of you have heard the term food desert. This is actually part of a, it was a term that was coined in the UK, actually, not in the United States. The UK, just as worried as the US about nutritional inequality and, and obesity, um, they formed a social exclusion unit to try and understand why it was that nutritional outcomes were different across neighborhoods and why obesity rates correspondingly were different across these neighborhoods. And they concluded in their report that one of the biggest causes of these inequalities was what they observed to be food deserts, namely neighborhoods where there literally weren't supermarkets that the kinds of stores in lower income neighborhoods tended to be what they call packing stores, small convenience stores or small drug stores that simply didn't have the, the floor capacity to have as many choices available and lack the economies of scale to be able to put things on the shelf at relatively affordable prices. So that's an observation. Uh, it was adopted by the Americans. In fact, the Administration for Children and Families has actually explicitly stated, stated that one of their key policy objectives is to, to get rid of food deserts. And again, saying bringing grocery stores and other healthy food retailers to underserved urban and rural communities across America, again, which they, deter, they term food deserts. In fact, some have gone so far as to term the food desert problem, again, the supply side story, the inequality in the kinds of stores and the kinds of products available across neighborhoods, not only as a nutrition problem, but as a matter of social justice. So if you look at the final statement here in this quote, this principle of fairness and equity needs to be reflected in neighborhood environments that facilitate healthy food choices for all societal strata. Why does this matter? Why do we care? I mean, we know there's an inequality problem here. I've already documented that and that's not in dispute today, but why does trying to understand the extent to which it comes from supply or demand matter? And the answer is coming back to government, public policy have already honed in on that supply side story. They've already spent billions of dollars trying to remedy food deserts. So, and my numbers are a little out of date here. These are numbers that come from 2017. So a lot more money's probably gone into this problem. Um, 400 million has already been spent 
by the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. This was spearheaded by Michelle Obama. Over one billion in addition to that has been spent largely on privately sourced funds. And of course, the Affordable Care Act, Care Act earmarked an additional $100 million for projects to eliminate food deserts. What do these monies do? In a nutshell, they're meant to be used as subsidies to incentivize supermarkets and, and, and large grocery stores to open shops in low-income neighborhoods that don't currently have a supermarket. So we'll be talking about in essentially billions of dollars being spent now to try and stimulate Whole Foods to put a Whole Foods in Englewood, for example. And that's fine, except for one small problem. There's actually no objective evidence that putting a supermarket in a low-income neighborhood causes people to buy and eat healthier food. There's very limited empirical evidence, certainly at the time these, these monies were allocated, uh, at best, a few isolated case studies. I've read all those case studies. I think the way a, a scientific uh, conclusion would be formed is that these are essentially inconclusive studies. So we look at event studies, a super, one supermarket enters, what happens? And the answer is not a whole lot. So we've earmarked all of these funds with no scientific evidence. Now, coming back again to my question, why do we care about supply and demand? Well, again, my background as an industrial organization economist would need, need to look at this problem and think, well, the kinds of food that are available and the prices that are charged for them, these are not things that happen purely like randomly. These are stores that are trying to figure out what people want. We think that generally when I look at what's on the shelf and what it costs, I think of this as an equilibrium outcome. And one of the determinants of what is supplied in equilibrium is, well, what do consumers want? It would One of the alternative theories I would have thought would be important for understanding this food desert or the, sorry, excuse me, for understanding nutritional inequality and its relationship to income would be, well, maybe people in different income brackets have different preferences. And if it was the case that people in different income brackets had different preferences, then I would be kind of inclined to think that spending a lot of money trying to put stores that nobody wanted into those neighborhoods or at least products into neighborhoods that people didn't want to buy would therefore have a very minimal, a de minimis kind of effect on nutritional inequality. So to me, trying to understand the extent to which is the supply demand has a really important implications because if this is demand driven, if the reason we see nutritional inequality is people don't want the same things across neighborhoods, then subsidizing stores isn't gonna have much effect and there may be a much better alternative ways to use those funds to try and remedy nutritional inequality. So I just wanna make sure I'm clear here. I am in total agreement. Nutritional inequality is a problem. It imposes a very big cost on our healthcare system. And frankly, it's just not good for people. Where my objections are is the way we've spent money a little frivolously on things that are poetically nice, but haven't been tested and true. We might be wasting a lot of money. I feel like I have to say this because when this paper started to get a little bit of attention in the media, uh, some groups immediately target us as being racist, uh, as being elitist. And of course, nobody is against the theory that making people eat healthier would be good for them. It's about how we solve this problem and how we spend money. So the first thing I did in this paper with my co-authors to try and ask, well, how do we test this food market, this, excuse me, food desert hypothesis? Not an easy task and our solution involved a lot of data. And this is where the marketing background comes in. A lot of the data we needed, we would normally think of as being marketing data types. So first thing we did was get a database. It's a nationally representative sample of hundreds of thousands of US households and in those data, it's a little Orwellian, uh, we get to observe everything they buy. I mean, right down to the barcode, I know the quantity and the barcode of everything that goes into your shopping basket for these 150,000 households um, and in pretty much any kind of store where you can buy prepackaged food. So convenience stores, drug stores, supermarkets, super centers, department stores to some extent. And I observe these shopping behaviors for over a decade, from 2004 to 2015. So the first thing is I have a big array of households and I know what kinds of foods they're buying. At the same time, I have a big database of stores. I have 35,000 stores, give or take, from 94 chains. They represent about 40% of retail sales or supermarket sales in the United States. And as a result, I have a reasonably good idea of what's available in these different neighborhoods in the US and what kind of prices are being charged across these neighborhoods in the US. And then we start to get in some of the more unusual parts of our database already, well, I guess one and two are already pretty, pretty substantial data sources, but we started then collecting information so that we would know the exact nutritional composition of each barcoded item in your shopping basket. I can literally evaluate the healthfulness of what you're buying in stores. 
And then finally, and this is where we're going to get into the sort of ex quasi-experimental aspect of this study, is I have a sample during this big time period of, 11, of approximately 11 years where I've seen nearly 7,000 supermarkets enter into different neighborhoods in the United States. And then the final bit of information is across neighborhoods in the US, I have some additional data on how much traffic congestion there is and how long it takes to travel from, let's say, your household, for example, to a supermarket. Okay, so that's the, that's the database that we're gonna put together. This took a fair amount of time to assemble. Um, before I get into some facts from these data, just a couple of definitions to help us out here in our, in our snapshot, our zoom in on the data, if you will. First thing is, well, what is a food desert? Loosely, I've defined this as a neighborhood that doesn't have any large format supermarkets. I'm going to use something a little more specific for our data analysis. I'm going to define it as a zip code that does not have a single supermarket, large grocery store, or super center. You might say a zip code is kind of an arbitrary definition in the paper. We also look at census tracts. We tried a bunch of other types of neighborhood definitions. Um, give or take, the results don't change very much as you zoom in or zoom out geographically on neighborhoods. Using our definition of zip codes, however, you might be interested to know that almost a quarter of U.S. zip codes would be described as food deserts. It's actually a little shocking in a way that a quarter of the neighborhoods in the United States don't have a supermarket, large grocery, or super center nearby. And if we focus on the subset of zip codes with median incomes below $25,000 a year, that's 55% of the zip codes. So again, there clearly are food deserts in the United States. The fact that those exist is not in, this, in the dispute. The issue is whether or not the fact that these neighborhoods don't have supermarkets is causing people to eat worse. That's really the key. Second thing is how we think of healthy eating. I'm using that score I mentioned earlier, the healthy eating index. This is a scale that was designed by the USDA to, to measure healthfulness of baskets of food. Um, so I'm not gonna dispute it. I'm gonna work with it since that's the one that's used for government. Um, you can go to their website and figure out how they came up with these scales. I'm not gonna go into detail on that today, but we do provide more context in the paper if you're interested. Basically what the HEI index does is it takes a basket of foods and assigns it a score that's normalized to lie between zero and one. So you can think of something with a score of zero as being basically totally non-nutritious, like devoid of any nutritious content, and something with a scale of one as being as nutritious as you can get on their scale. Um, all right, so with those definitions and the data in mind, it's a couple of facts, more than a couple, a few facts, right? First thing I wanna show is people really do buy worse food in lower income neighborhoods. This is something that jumps out from the data as soon as we started analyzing them. So I've taken three different nutrients. We have 12 nutrients we studied in the paper. Well, here's three different nutrients. Let's start off with sugar. I think we all agree sugar all else equals a bad nutrient. And sure enough, you can see that as you move from the left to the right here, from the lowest income to the highest income households in our sample, the quantity of added sugars people are buying per thousand calories in their, in their grocery basket is declining with the income and declining quite a bit, right? you know, from 55 grams of sugar down to 40 grams of sugar. That's 15 less grams of sugar, added sugars per thousand calories purchased. And when we turn to some healthy nutrients or good nutrients like produce and whole grain, for example, we can see the exact reverse pattern, right? That higher income households buy more good nutrients and buy fewer bad nutrients. And of course, the summary of interest here is, of course, aggregating all those nutrients together and formulating a healthfulness index. And this was the picture I showed you at the beginning, which just says that higher income neighborhoods seem to buy healthier baskets of, of food. And of course, the gap here is 0.56. For now, the question you're probably wondering is, is 0.56 big or small? What does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything because the scale lies between zero and one. So we do take a little bit of time in the paper to try and see, does 5.6 seem associated? with stuff we would think is kind of important, especially if the objective of food desert policy is to make people eat healthier, to reduce obesity, and ultimately to reduce some of that burden on our medical system. So just as a for example, high income households in our data buy 8.9 grams less sugar per thousand calories than low income households. Well, if I go to the medical study by Yang et al, that difference in the quantity of sugar being purchased is associated with a 26% decrease in the death rate from cardiovascular disease. To me, that struck me as pretty economically big, right? So again, I can reduce your, well, 
it's associated with, we have to be very careful with causal statements here, it's associated with a 25% reduction in the in death rate. And correlational analysis of our own data shows that that gap, that 0.56 gap in the healthy, in, healthy eating index is associated with more than a half, a half a unit of BMI. So BMIs in our data of households who are at the top of the spectrum versus the bottom of the spectrum of healthy eating differ by almost, by almost 0.7 BMI points. And they're associated with a 1.9 percentage point difference in the probability of diabetes. This was something we got through a survey. In other words, even though the, the number 0.56 seems hard to interpret, that's the gap we're trying to explain, it seems to be associated with some pretty substantial differences in health outcomes. All right, so, so far all I showed you is that people shop less healthfully in low-income neighbors than high-income neighborhoods. It's also the case that what's available in those neighborhoods is less healthy as well. So this is no longer a study of what's being, what's being sold or what's being purchased, excuse me, but rather what's actually for sale, what's on the shelves. And sure enough, you can see that as we move from the least to the highest income neighborhoods, these are zip codes now, you can see that the stores in those neighborhoods sell a lot more stuff, right? Or have for sale available a lot more stuff with added sugars. So there's more bad nutrients in the low income zip codes and there's more good nutrients in the high income zip codes. So it sort of mirrors what we saw in the shopping data. We see it, what we're seeing mirroring there is what's actually for sale. And it is indeed the case that the kind of stores that are in US bad, uh, low income neighborhoods are fundamentally different from high income neighborhoods, just like in the UK. That in fact, as we go from the lowest to the highest income zip codes, the number of supermarkets in those neighborhoods does increase. Goes from about 0.4 or 0.45 to almost point to almost 0.8, which means there's like half a supermarket more on average, if you will, in higher income neighborhoods than lower income neighborhoods. And similarly, as you go from low to low to high income neighborhoods, you see considerably fewer drug and convenience stores. So again. People shop less healthfully in low-income neighborhoods, but it's also the case that there's less healthy stuff available and there aren't as many large format stores that have more variety available to consumers. So you can see oh, this is a challenging problem here. It's not clear whether this is supply or demand. So what we're going to now do is try and use those case studies, all those supermarkets that entered, to try and test the food market hypothesis and try and ask the question, if I was to take one of these so-called food deserts in my neighborhood and insert a supermarket in it, would this cause people to buy healthier food? So how are we gonna do that? Again, we have almost 7,000 such events in our data. And remember at our data set, we have individual households and we get to see everything they're buying. And so the way the, the quasi experiment is gonna work is I get to see the same household shopping before and after a supermarket enters. And the idea then is to look within that household and see in the medium term, in the short term, after that supermarket enters, do you change where you shop? And more importantly, do you change what you spend your money on? Do you start buying different kinds of products? And most importantly, are they looking healthier? Okay, so that's the underlying idea. So let's look at this event study evidence. There's obviously more details into how you make what I just described seem like an experiment, but I think I give you the conceptual idea. So here's what happens. So what we've got in these panels here are the number of quarters after a supermarket enters. So zero meaning the timing of entry, the negative being quarters before and then quarters after. So we have already up to eight quarters after a supermarket enters. Um, we can look and see what happens to people's shopping behavior. So let's start with that first panel at the top. First question is, when you put a supermarket in someone's neighborhood, do they shop in it? And the answer is yes. That vertical axis represents the share of your total spending in that quarter that's in the chain corresponding to which the supermarket that entered. And sure enough, you put a supermarket in someone's neighborhood, they do start shopping in it. That chain starts to divert spending away from other stores that you were shopping in previously, right? So there is some diversion, right? And maybe that's a good thing, right? I mean, after all, maybe I don't have to travel as far now to go shopping. But if we go to the second panel here, you can see that there's very little diversion away from other grocery, supermarket, and club stores. In other words, I'm going to start shopping in Safeway once you put a Safeway in my neighborhood, but I'm still spending approximately the same as in overall supermarkets as I was beforehand. I'm just shopping in a different supermarket than I was before. And then most importantly, come to this bottom panel, 
And while there's a little bit of noise here, almost nothing seems to happen to the composition of my shopping back, at least in terms of how healthy the stuff is that I'm buying. Even eight quarters after the supermarket enters, my shopping basket doesn't really look very different than it did prior to the entry of this new supermarket. And I do the same thing on the, on the right side here, where instead of focusing on all neighborhoods of the US that get supermarkets, I only focus on the subset of US neighborhoods that we would describe as being a food desert. And you can see that what happens in the average neighborhood doesn't look very different from what happens in a food desert neighborhood, give or take a bit. In other words, you put a supermarket into a food desert, people will shop in it, but they're still buying the same kinds of products that they were buying prior to the entry of that supermarket, right? This is a little bit of a mathematical exercise here, but the idea was to try and take what we learned from these graphs and, and a more rigorous version of what's in these graphs and ask, at most, what fraction of that 0.56 healthy eating gap that I documented at the start, at most, how much of that is explained by supermarkets? right, and the availability. So how are we gonna do that? Well, that top number, 0 0.02, that's how much I estimate to be the largest possible effect I can't rule out, technically speaking, for the stat statisticians in the room, this is the upper bound of a 95% confidence interval. For the non-statisticians in the room, think of this as the largest number I fail to reject at a 5% significance level, which is about me being worried about finding false positives. and Multiplying that by the difference between the number of supermarkets in the poorest and the wealthiest neighborhoods, which is number 0.44 supermarkets, and we see that as a fraction of the 0.56, at best, we're explaining one and a half percent of the gap. So let me step back from the, the, the algebraic exercise and just talk about this conceptually. Given the evidence I got from nearly 7,000 case studies of supermarkets entering and looking at before after behavior and consumer shopping, at most, I explain one and a half percent of that nutrition income relationship that motivated the start of this talk, which means there's a heck of a lot of nutritional inequality still not explained, even after I put supermarkets in. This already for us was a bit of a smoking gun against the food desert hypothesis and led us to believe subsidizing supermarkets to enter neighborhoods didn't seem like it was going to be a very useful cure, at least in the short term. I mean, you can't rule out that maybe if I had waited 20 years, maybe then we would see substantial difference in eating. But at least over the course of a couple of years, people are still eating the same basic unhealthy baskets in food deserts after you put in a supermarket. And in a way, that wasn't very surprising. Because if we look at people's shopping behavior in the US, we would see that people drive a long way to go shopping. So what's happening in poor neighborhoods, right, and food deserts in particular, is people just have to drive a really long way to go to the store. People are driving several miles. So in a way, you could argue maybe putting supermarkets into food deserts is solving a problem. It's helping people shop more conveniently and saving them time. And for sure, somebody who's working two jobs might benefit from that. But let's not forget, the HFFI didn't allocate a half billion dollars to help people solve travel time. It was supposed to remedy food inequality, nutrition inequality, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So while there may be other benefits from these supermarkets, the earmarked purposes of these funds doesn't seem to be being accomplished. And by the way, and this sort of meant to, to correspond to that last slide saying people are driving a long way, whether we look at the average household, we look at the full sample, that's the blue curve, or we look at people living in food deserts specifically, we can see that even in the poorest neighborhoods, people are mostly shopping in supermarkets already. In food deserts, on average, 88% of people shopping trips are in supermarkets. It's just that people are traveling five miles or more to go shopping. So again, I give you a supermarket, cool, now I only have to shop, drive one mile to go shopping, but I'm still gonna buy really bad food in that local supermarket because giving me a new supermarket didn't change the choice set, if you will, because I was already driving away and driving a long way before and getting that big choice set. Which means that if the supply side isn't really explaining things, there's a whole separate analysis I didn't put in the deck today because of our short amount of time, but there's also an analysis of prices where I show that in fact, there is not nearly as big of a price disparity as some of the, some of the rhetoric we've been hearing in, in, from the White House and other sources would lead us to believe. So again, availability doesn't seem to be effect, explaining much of inequality. And prices also, even though I don't have a slide on it here, don't seem to be explaining this, which means what's left then? The demand side. Now, there's a whole technical component here that goes on the demand side, and Anil asked me to try and minimize some of that technical component. But the idea was, how do you test and how do you measure people's preferences for healthy food? That's actually a, a tall order, 
I'll give you a little context for why it's difficult. There are over 500,000 different barcoded products, each with its own unique combination of nutrients that are purchased in our data. So imagine now having to build a model to try and explain people's preferences and their demand for 500,000 very differentiated products. So this is a modeling exercise, and there's a lot of detail in the paper on that. Um, but the purpose of that modeling exercise was to be able to measure how sensitive people are to prices in different income groups and how much preference they have for different kinds of nutrients, both good and bad nutrients, and then what kind of product categories they tend to shop in. For example, do I tend to buy more frozen food? Do I tend to buy more shelf-stable food? Or do I tend to buy more produce, right? So that was the goal is to measure these things, but it's not very easy and there's a whole modeling exercise. And you can see the paper where we talk about our empirical strategy for coming up with these measurements. So what I'm gonna do instead is just jump straight to the punchline here. I'm having a little trouble seeing the green. Oh, I do? Oh, oh okay, I was uh, trying to, I couldn't tell how much time I had here. Okay, very well. So what do I do with these demand estimates? The demand estimates then are being used to try and get a sense of how much difference there is in people's willingness to pay for healthy foods when you move from the lowest to the highest income households in our sample. And so what we did was we constructed then, as a, to try and put this to sort of bring this to bring this to life, is we constructed the recommended daily bundle of nutrients according to the USDA. And then we took our demand measurements and said, what's your maximum willingness to pay if you're in one of the four different income quartiles in our data? So again, this is using our demand model. We tried to predict what is the most somebody making under 25,000 a year would be willing to pay for that daily recommended nutrients. And this is on a per thousand calorie basis. And we then compare that to somebody who's making over 75,000 a year in our sample. And what do you see? A really big difference. People in the highest income brackets are willing to pay two and a half times as much as people in the lowest income bracket to buy that daily recommended bundle of nutrients as per the USDA. Okay, so, and how did I do all of this? I had another slide, which I removed here, but in the other slide, I actually showed that people had very different willingness to pay for the underlying nutrients of that basket. That consumer willingness to pay for good nutrients was increasing with income and was decreasing with income for bad nutrients. That's how we ended up with these numbers. And more importantly, if I now was to ask a question, if I take the total nutrition income relationship, that gap between the healthfulness of what the poorest households are buying and the wealthiest households are buying in our sample, what percentage of that gap is coming from supply versus demand explanations? Well, as I focus on pricing, and again, I didn't even have a slide on that, it was almost zero. Um, if we go over here to availability, right? This is at most about 50, you know, we, we had, we, we, this is using the demand model as well, was most maybe about 15 percentage of points, 15 percentage points, maybe a little bit less, but over 80% of the nutrition income relationship seems to be explained by a combination of what kind of categories are you shopping in? Are you buying frozen foods or shelf stable foods? And more importantly, what's your value, you know, your, your intrinsic value? What's your willingness to pay for nutrients? So you can see here that coming back to the income gap, the thing we're supposed to be remedying with these billions of dollars of funds, over 80% of that gap is coming from what people want and what they're willing to spend on it. And very little of it is coming from what's available and what's being charged for it. So then we do a little correlational exercise to try and see, well, what kinds of things, this is purely exploratory, you know, but what kinds of things seem to be associated with the folks who have a really high versus the folks who have a really low willingness to pay for healthy food baskets. And two key things sort of pop out here. Again, these are correlations. We don't know whether these are incidentally correlated or if these are causal, but it's still an interesting exploratory fact. We find that years of education is very strongly associated with your willingness to pay for healthy nutrients. That led us to immediately conclude, wow, seems like this may be related to information and knowledge. Doesn't mean we've con conclusively determined that, but it certainly seems strongly suggestive. So we then ran a survey. We, this is one of the cool things about working with Nielsen is that for a fee, <laughs> it's not a small fee I'll add, um, you can actually survey those tens of thousands of households and ask them questions. So what did we do? We ran a nutrition quiz. We took a quiz that's used in the health sciences literature and had over 60,000 households complete this quiz. So we kind of know who scores high and who scores low. And guess what? The healthfulness of, you, of what you buy is also fairly strongly correlated 
with what your knowledge about nutrition. So we have two key things that emerge from this exploratory exercise. The kinds of households that are shopping more healthfully tend to have more years of education and also tend to have a higher score on our nutrition quiz, which led us to conclude, even though it's not that the right direction for new research might be to spend money on trying to educate people. Anecdotally, I, I presented some of my work at several medical schools over the years, and it was really interesting working with folks in pediatric medicine, especially at the University of Chicago, where they actually could say firsthand that one of the biggest challenges they have when parents come in with kids under five who are already struggling with obesity is the lack of knowledge not of, that the parents have, first of all, in acknowledging that the obesity is a problem, but second, in acknowledging that the way they feed their kids might be the solution. Related to that problem, of course, is the struggle they have at a lot of the food the kids eat is outside of the parents' control because the healthfulness of the food that's available in their schools tends to score pretty low as well. I can speak firsthand on this. Uh, kids who are going to element, we're going to nursery school in Hyde Park. And one of the main reasons for us leaving Hyde Park was the availability of resources for the kids in the public schools were really poor. I mean, my, my, my son was being fed microwaved hamburgers in a plastic bag. When you move to the North suburbs, the food supply they get has more salads, <laughs> produce, right? Just better food quality. At any rate, I have not conclusively shown that lack of knowledge causes bad eating, but it's still strongly suggestive since it's so strongly correlated. So let's think about the last part of this talk then. Let's say, well, if our goal is to spend money to try and remedy nutrition inequality, are there things we could do with the same monies that have been used to subsidize supermarkets? Are there things we might do hypothetically to try and get a better outcome, right? So what we decided to do is use our demand estimates and to design means-tested programs where we would actually target subsidies. And how would these subsidies work, right? The idea is we would only give these subsidies to people in the lowest income group, right? So this is approximately 25% of US households or 31 million, 31 million. And the idea is these subsidies would only target foods that scored above average uh, in terms of their healthfulness, right? So the idea is let's think of like some hypothetical targeted subsidy programs be kind of like food stamps, except these would be food stamps that would be more, more restricted that, in that you could only use them on very specific kinds of UPC codes and that the food stamps would only be available to people specifically in this group. So we looked at two hypothetical programs. And the first one we asked was, how expensive would it be to use subsidies to get the exact same reduction in nutritional inequality as we predict we are already getting by subsidizing supermarkets? Now remember, Supermarkets aren't having a very big impact according to our estimates, right? So the question is, if we're satisfied with that reduction, what would we get if we instead targeted the food subsidies? Our prediction was with $830 million a year, right? We could actually, we could get approximately the same benefit as we're getting currently from billions of dollars a year that were spent. And remember, this is not billion dollars per year, billions of dollars, excuse me, already spent once, right? I don't know what the what the long term is, but billions of dollars spent, $830 million versus hundreds of millions spent by the HFFI on store entries. Okay, so it doesn't seem like targeted subsidies are that cheap if our goal is to, to get the same outcome as stores. However, and this was, I think, the program that was more interesting for us. What if we actually targeted the entire gap? How expensive would it be to subsidize food, right? in a way that would we predict would completely eliminate that gap. And our estimates came up to approximately $11 billion a year. Well, that's obviously a much bigger ticket than what's being spent by the HSFI. However, keep in mind, that's only 15% of the current SNAP budget. On food stamps, we're already spending $71 billion a year as of 2016. I don't have the most recent numbers on that. So this actually seems relatively modest compared to food stamps. Moreover, this is a program that's designed to reduce the entire gap so takeaway from all of this was there may be better ways to use money where we actually could achieve bigger health outcomes or be better health outcomes. We could uh, better, better resolve some of that inequity that I started off at the beginning. And some suggestive evidence that part of the source of the problem uh, before we start spending money on anything uh, seems to be information. So just to summarize then, the food desert hypothesis, which I would, again, I repeat, is really the conventional wisdom, uh, in, at least in public policy circles, for why we have nutritional inequality, is all about targeting 
um, is, is at most targeting a very modest part of nutritional inequality. I would go so far as my own personal conclusion is to describe the monies we've been using this as a gross misallocation. Um, the evidence suggests that a lot of the nutritional inequality we observe has to do with differences in preferences, uh, which means we probably want to be pursuing demand side demand demand targeted policies rather than supply targeted policies. I gave you a couple of examples there briefly, which would suggest such demand side targeted excuse me demand targeted policies seem like they're economically plausible that we could do something at a small fraction of what we're already spending on food stamps, and then hopefully some compelling and suggestive evidence that maybe what we should be really focusing on longer term is thinking about how to educate people better about what they eat. All right, thank you very much. Okay, um, we'll now have a uh, short musical interlude where you can collect your thoughts uh, for the questions. Uh, during that time, we're gonna have collections that are um, to be collected. There's a basket in the back that you can uh, go and uh, drop, drop money in if you care to. Uh, there's also a, a website that uh, address is shown on the uh, YouTube uh, channel if you want to do that, or if you're in the auditorium, you can scan the QR code that's uh, posted. Through the generosity of uh, the people that make these donations, uh, you're able to show how meaningful these programs are. We suggest a donation of $5, but that's not a ceiling or a floor. We appreciate anything you can spare, and we also are grateful for everything that the members do to sustain the society. Um, you can, if you're watching online, you can start uh, typing your questions into the chat. We're going to uh, collect a few and then we'll we'll proceed. So uh, please go ahead and listen to the music, collect your thoughts, and we'll be back in a second. <laughs> ahead and line up here and uh, we'll start with Svetlana. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, actually, I have two questions, if you don't mind. One is a clarification. When you say the difference in willingness to pay, do you mean that all things being equal, if I have a dollar mm -hmm. to spend on potato chips or kale, 
the higher income that I am, I'm more likely to spend that dollar on the kale than the potato chips. Because I keep thinking, but I'm, I have more money, so I can buy kale and potato. You know what I mean? Like, can you explain to me what you mean? Demand equals willingness to pay. Well, demand doesn't equal willingness to pay. From people's demand behavior, we can infer a willingness to pay. And so the idea would be, um, let's suppose that right now there's a basket that that USDA recommended back his basket of nutrients, and it's for sale. And you could either buy it using your money, whatever your whatever your your funds are, or if you don't buy it, you can use your money to buy whatever you normally buy, right? So be everything else, right? And it's that everything else that's sort of buried in your question. And, and to define that, I would need to get into the details of the model. But the idea is if I either buy it or I don't buy it. And the question that we then, use, or the, the thing that we then measure on that is, what is the most that I would be willing to pay for that? And I guess you could think of the most is, what's the highest price that could be charged for that basket that would make me buy it? Mm -hmm. And if it's any higher than that, I wouldn't buy it. I'd just spend my money on other stuff, right? And what we've learned from our demand analysis is that the highest income households would be willing to pay more than two and a half times as much for that basket as the household in the lowest income bracket. Is the, is the answer to her question, though, that you can notice the poor person is much more price sensitive to kale than potato chips, that that's what's going to drive the answer? Okay, so if you want to decompose this, so maybe that's okay. So the next related to that question is why or what's driving that willingness mm, to yeah, pay? Yeah, yeah. And the answer is that in our analysis of people's preferences, we found that people in low income in low income households had a very high value for added sugars. It was actually striking. That was the one nutrient where it changes sign. That people in high income households have a negative value for added sugars. People in low income households have a positive value for it. Which means if you were to if you look at our shopping data, you wouldn't be surprised to see a lot more sweetened things like really low, what you would probably describe as low quality breakfast cereals, for example, like Fruit Loops. Although Fruit Loops has reduced its sugar content a lot, but things like that. And meanwhile, when you go to things like stuff that has has fresh fruit in it, we have products with fresh fruit in it, or things that have a lot of whole grain in it, as opposed, you know, so like brown bread versus white bread, for example, you would see a declining willingness to pay that those low income households have less value for whole grain, for example, than people in the high income household. They have less value for organic milk than people in high income households. And when you put all those things together, you end up with a low income household, just not be willing to pay as much for that recommended basket. Because remember the basket that the USDA is recommending has a lot of high, a lot of good nutrients and not very much bad nutrients. Does that, does that, does that? It clarify? does answer and Perfect. I'll come back. I have a question. Sure. Um, I just have a question about what the food industries uh, have to have to do and how they input in all of this. Um, if the government were to subsidize uh, healthy food in low income areas, uh, would what kind of trouble would they get from lobbyists from the food industry? So, first of all, I, I, I love that question because that's oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, I love that question, but especially what I love about it is the one, it just sort of immediately addresses a flaw in my so-called means-tested simulations, because when I ran those means-tested simulations, the assumption was I'm going to put all these subsidies out there, and consumers are allowed to change what they buy, but everything else stays the same. And you got to figure, if there's all this money flowing in as subsidies to certain kinds of foods, that the industry is going to respond. Now, you said they're going to respond with lobbies to try and blockade this kind of a policy, and that's very plausible. But the other way things may respond is you may see a whole bunch of firms start popping up, which will change the supply of foods, change the prices. And it's really unclear once we accommodate all of those responses, whether or not our means tested program will work even better. It could actually amplify it. If there's all sorts of healthy things to buy now compared to the past, then the subsidies are going to work really well. But it might have some weird unintended consequences I haven't even thought about yet, right? Yeah. And obviously, one of the bad unintended consequences is that a whole bunch of public funds are wasted trying to address these lobby groups, right? But I will say one thing. If you're looking for an interesting book to read, it's called Combat Ready Kitchen. I read this book over the oh, two summers ago. I did a lot of reading, actually. Uh, one of the positive aspects of lockdowns was I did a lot more reading than I've done in a while. Oh, sorry, I should say a lot more non-work-related reading, although this is somewhat related to my work. Combat Ready Kitchen really opened my eyes to the food industry. And I'll try not to dwell on this too much since it's a little off topic, but um, it goes all the way back to the Second World War and the history of government grants for research and development in the packaged foods. And what I learned from this was how many 
billions of dollars have been spent developing patents that are commercially owned by the food companies, Kraft, for example, um, and you know, ConAgra, for example. And all of these patents were co-developed with the military. And going back to World War II, these patents started with the military saying it's very hard for the military to do R&D to create combat rations. So why don't we outsource all of that research to food firms? And the deal was, we will give you X million dollars of funding to develop a, a shelf-stable product that provides certain nutrients to people who are at the front lines. And, the, you know, during Desert Storm, the rules was three years at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Believe it or not, they came up with hamburgers that could sit unrefrigerated in heats of up to 85 degrees for three years. And you would get this in a shrink wrap pouch. It was all put through an extruder. There's a pouch with a chemical in it. When you prick it, it suddenly heats things up in 30 seconds. So you're eating a hot hamburger with melted cheese on it at the front line. And how did they incentivize them to do this? They said, not only will we provide the funding for the research, you can have full rights to the commercial, the commercialization of these patents. And you can be sure that almost all of these food patents that we see owned by the, by the food industry are coming from those things. So for example, Cheetos, not something we would normally think of as a very healthy thing. Cheetos was the result of the military trying to figure out how you transport dairy to the front lines in World War II. It's very difficult because dairy has a, lot of, has a lot of liquid in it. And so Cheetos was actually what happens when you extract all of the moisture and then try and reconstitute milk. And the answer is you can't. But what they ended up in the process was this very sticky milk-like paste, which you could then create a cheese-like substance and you could use it to coat stuff. Cheetos, right? And there's plenty of examples of food. But if you think about all of the prepackaged foods that we grew up on, breakfast cereals, crackers, everything we ate was in a shrink wrap bag. It was extruded. And it means it was put, cooked and coated with stuff at very high heat and very high pressure. These are all based on patents that were developed by the military. And it's hard not to wonder, and you know, I'm speculating, and this is me going way off course because this is not very scientific at all, but how much of this obesity is coming from us eating food that was the result of military R&D <laughs> cooperations and was never intended to be something that we eat on a daily basis, something you eat for two weeks on the front line is very different from what we're eating on a regular daily basis. So I've been trying to, I haven't gotten started on this, but one of the things I want to do is collect a database and I need an army of RAs to do this, to try and go through all of the patents owned by these companies and to see what fraction of our food patents are actually associated with this military spending and to try and come back to understanding how much of his obesity is coming from us eating things that shouldn't really be on the shelves. Sorry, long answer, but <laughs> started with a, with a really good question, though. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, so I feel like part of the popular narrative about the nutrition gap is that um, like calorie for calorie, um, unhealthy food is much cheaper than healthy food. Um, and I think you said something about how you had some slides about price and then you took them out. But I guess that willingness to pay, is that not just a willingness to pay for more like efficient calories? Like you get more calories for that dollar than you like if you buy the potato chips, then you get like you get more full if you eat a bag of potato chips than a bag of kale. So is it not is the preference still just a price consideration? So first, just, just quick clarification here. How much somebody is willing to pay is distinct from how much it costs, right? And of course, the, the only the way these two things are linked is if the price is below what you're willing to pay, then you'll buy it. If it's above, then you won't buy it. But these are still two different constructs. But but the, the bigger part of your question here had to do with had to do with thinking about prices in general and how they and how they correlate with healthfulness. And, you know, our first instinct is to immediately think of like, well, you know, organic tomatoes are more expensive than ketchup, right? Or something like that. But when you actually go into a supermarket, there are a lot of cases where you have a very strong health choice with no price consideration at all. One of my favorite aisles is the yogurt aisle. Because the yogurt aisle is one of those aisles where you have products on the shelf at pretty much the same price that range from almost a score of zero. There's stuff that's in the yogurt aisle that's basically candy. And there's stuff that's in the yogurt aisle that's essentially just 
calcium and, 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 other, and other basic nutrients. You have stuff that almost goes from zero to 100 on that HEI scale, and the price is virtually the same. And if you go aisle by aisle, there are plenty of trade-offs like that. And so while it's true, there are certain kinds of products that we think of as being healthy, and they are more expensive. Produce is more expensive than other things, right? Within aisles, people also face trade-offs. And when you go to poor and wealthy neighborhoods in our data, you can see that people in the north suburbs of Chicago are eating the, the healthy yogurts. They're eating Greek yogurts with very little adds, additives in it. And when you go to the poorer neighborhood, people are eating like go and things like that. Very similar prices, but it's a very different product. One of the things I took from your conclusion was that building these grocery stores will not solve the nutritional problem of poor people. I'm assuming that's correct. So, but the corollary question I have, which makes me think your conclusion is not correct, is could we solve the nutritional problem amongst poor people without building these grocery stores? Because I think the answer is no. So, I think so it, the point here is that we need to create a demand before it makes sense to subsidize the supply, right? It's, you know, this whole project, by the way, started with a conference I organized in 2010 at Booth when I first started working with these Nielsen data, I thought it'd be interesting to bring people from health economics, from marketing, from, from psychology, all these people in medicine who study nutrition will have a one day session. And I invited some guest speakers from the, the NHI to come in and speak. And there was a woman from the NHI who spoke and was, she'd been given a grant of almost about a million dollars. And she was gonna go and do these pilot programs in different cities like Baltimore and Chicago, and was gonna go into poor neighborhoods and put products in these stores. She goes, you can't buy a fresh apple in the stores in some of these neighborhoods. So she's going to put apples. So I actually put up my hand and instantly asked a question, do people in these neighborhoods want apples? And, and she didn't answer my question. Just her answer was actually got a little upset about my question. Like that, she was typical. I go, what do you mean typical? She goes, that's typical. That's how people who don't understand how hard it is to eat healthy in these neighborhoods. That's the kind of answer you'd ask. Obviously, it's kind of an elitist question. I go, well, but elitist or not, I'd still like to know the answer. Do we have any evidence people want an apple? And just we never actually got an answer to that question. Instead of answering the question, I just kept getting told this was an elitist question and it got increasingly hostile. So, okay, don't worry about it. We can talk about it offline. And this is what got me interested in this question. Before we start building stores or providing millions of dollars of apples, of free apples, we first need people to want to eat them. And I don't know if you ever watched that Jamie Oliver special where, where he came to the US and worked with several households on TV and he would spend a week in a household teaching them how to cook healthy meals and a journalist, two, a journalist a week later went and found all of the food they'd made together and the garbages behind these households. And that's kind of the, pro that's kind of the narrative here. That you can give people a free apple, they'll toss it away. There's a reason why my kid's school in Hyde Park, there was no produce. Some of the kids in that school didn't want produce. They actually wanted a microwaved hamburger. So the, before we can build a store where people can buy good stuff, we first need to educate people to want to buy that good stuff. Okay, I got some some online questions here. I'm going to sure. give you a couple. One's right on the point you just asked, which is, are there any experiments that people have done where you can actually modify the preferences of the lower income or lower education people to to switch them to want the apple? And then um, I think I know the answer to this, but just to be clear, uh, was there anybody that funded your research? Um, yeah, so let me start with the funding because those are really, I think these are really critical questions nowadays, especially as people in marketing and economics start doing more public policy oriented work. You'd like to know, was there somebody sponsoring who might have a vested interest? In this case, the answer is no. I was funded by the University of Chicago. Um, I had a grant, I used grant money to buy some of this. I think one of the grants was from the IGM, which is a center that Anil was actually running at the time. So and given what you know about Anil's personal interest, that may or may not make you feel good or bad about the, the answer to my question. But no, we, none of us were. Um, there was one co-author on the project who is from the USDA, but uh, you would be, and that could be a potential conflict of interest. That was not originally a co-author of ours, by the way, where there was two competing papers on the same project, on the same topic. And we decided, or I decided, since I was the oldest person of all the co-authors, instead of battling over the, which paper is, was first, why don't we just join forces? And a special exception was made because actually people from the USDA aren't authorized to use the Nielsen data as they are, even though they're in government, they're treated as a commercial interest. But our results came before that union. So short answer is there was no, there was no reason to be worried about a conflict of interest here. The second part of that question though was, the, was related to, has anyone run an experiment? Not exactly, 
Um, you know, unfortunately, in the in a lot of the field work that's done in medicine outside of actual like medical interventions is non-experimental. It's a lot of observational analysis, which means we really can't learn much. There's been some survey work, but again, nothing really like an intervention that we would like a randomized experiment. I'm in the process of working with Kroger and trying to build a relationship with Kroger with the University of Chicago so that we can do those exactly those kinds of studies. And you'll be pleased to know maybe that nutritional health, nutrition and healthy eating is one of their main areas of interest. And that's exactly what I'd like to do in Kroger's is randomly assign Kroger supermarkets to have base cases or control stores where they just keep doing the same thing. And one of the things I'd like to test is what kind of information in the store might or might not change what people shop. But I'm afraid to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this by saying I'm a little skeptical we're going to find anything because I've got a whole side area of research where I look at things like why do people spend a price premium for branded goods when there's an identical unbranded alternative? So why do people spend $7 for a jar of Bayer aspirin when you can buy CVS branded aspirin at half the price and it's the same molecule? In fact, it's usually made in the same factory. It's literally the same manufacturer. They just didn't put all the colorings onto the packaging, right? So why are people doing this? And there have been interventions done. I've done some of them myself, but interventions where you tell people, so actually some folks at Berkeley ran an experiment in supermarkets where they put signs on the shelf that said, this is the same molecule, had no effect. No effect. You still saw, even though more people buy unbranded pills, there's enough people buying branded versions and paying a price premium. There's more revenues coming into the store from the branded pills than the unbranded pills. And you see the same thing with flour and baking sodas and stuff like that. There's all sorts of products where there's almost a physically identical store brand available, but most of the sales in the category are still coming from the branded good. Given that telling people it's the same doesn't have much effect, I would be suspicious if a short-term intervention where we just told people about healthy eating would have much of an effect, but I would love to be convinced that I'm wrong on that one. <laughs> Good morning. Um, you started out your talk with um, talking about the huge, acknowledging the huge medical cost of uh, nutritionally underserved areas. Um, I think there's, a, I'm not sure, but I think there's a strong correlation between nutritionally underserved areas and medically underserved areas. So I was wondering if you think in addition to um, educational opportunities to change the tide, if there's also a role for the medical um, establishment or institutions or uh, population to serve, to play a role in, in battling that? The, the, well, that was why I shared anecdotally my story at the, at the, at the UFC, the Med at the Pritzker School of Medicine, right, that um, people who work in, in pediatric medicine, especially people working in the, in the at the UFC hospital, were extremely excited about this because this is something they've struggled with, right? And, and I, don't, I just don't know the answer. I don't, I've never worked in that domain, so I don't know how much influence um, a pediatrician in the hospital has over the foods that parents buy. It's for sure, if you're in the North Shore and the doctor says your kid needs to eat X, you're probably going to buy them X. I don't know if the same is true in a lower income neighborhood. I just don't know how much trust people put in those, those recommendations. Certainly those doctors, when I presented to them, said it's very difficult for them because it's not just a matter of them persuading people to do something different with their kids. It's about persuading that there's actually something wrong in the first place, that you have a, a seven-year-old weigh, weighing over 100 pounds is a really big problem. There's um, a couple of online questions that are closely related to what you just said. Um, one of them is um, the, the fact that these things are long-run problems and they've been present for a long, long time and there's so many uh, co-determinants of, of you know, what you eat and why you eat it and all that. Um, is there any research that's, that looks more at long run factors and whether or not there's there's anything in the time dimension that, that changes as they had in mind, you know, whether or not you, you, you have access to demos and things like that that you see over and over and over again to, to change things. And then um, is the food industry, you mentioned Kroger uh, being willing to do this, it sounds like uh, implicitly you're thinking that it's not actually the grocery stores that care which calories they serve you or what they, they care, maybe the manufacturers, but I'd like you to elaborate on whether or not if the persistence of these uh, choices as the status quo benefits any particular actor in the, in the food chain. 
yeah, the persistence in people's preferences benefits the consumer packaged goods industry. And that's why I went on this long uh, personal tirade about combat ready kitchen. I think that the majority of what's sold by the consumer packaged goods industry just isn't that good for us. I mean, we eat it because it's convenient. We eat it because it's familiar and, and, as, and we eat it because it's a habit. <laughs> it's what we always ate. Um, but I don't think these things are really meant to be consumed on a long run basis. And there's certainly a commercial interest there. What is encouraging is how many categories are being disrupted, um, especially since 2005 about. And there's something interesting about 2005. This is when a lot of food associations started forming on the web. Um, I did a study of craft beers a couple of two years, a year ago. Um, and 2005 was the takeoff point. If you look at 2005 to 2020, the share of beer that people were, the, the total share of sales that wasn't coming from the big six manufacturers of beer, which they all make pale lagers. We're talking Budweiser, Miller, et cetera. Like over 90% was them. I think it was 4% of total beer sales in the US in 2005 was coming from craft beers. Um, today, it's like getting close to 20%. And that's amazing because I, I mean, it, when I was an assistant professor, part of my research agenda was showing that brands that were first to market at the end of the 1800s in the US are still dominant today. So I can tell you, which is a Coke city and which is a Pepsi city by just going back to the 1800s and telling you who got there first. I can tell you which is a Hunt city, which is a Heinz city the same way, which is a Yoplait, which is a Danon city. There's these incredible economic geography and brand preferences, right? And these persisted. I mean, these firms were persistently dominant for a century. Now, all of a sudden, that dominance is slowly starting to erode. People love to talk about millennials and they think millennials are somehow wired differently. I still don't think millennials are wired differently. But it's true that our kids and kid, people who are just slightly older than my kids um, grew up at a time when there was more stuff becoming available. And what's special about 2005? Around that time, bandwidth was strong enough that it wasn't very hard for a small startup that has a new organic product to create a website and distribute it online. Prior to that, you would have had to get shelf space in a store. And we're starting to see more and more of these new consumer goods startups coming out who are supplying healthier alternatives, more sustainable products, more sustainable packaging, and it is getting traction. And it may very well be that we don't need a national health policy, that the big incumbents will be forced to respond with healthier food options or else they'll cease to get purchased, right? We'll just, as, as the older generations die off and are replaced by the younger generations, there won't be that intrinsic demand for the branded good anymore. So that may play a role It's sort of like, you know, you can think of this as Schumpeterian creative destruction, if you will, that we don't need the government. This was going to happen anyhow. But, yeah, be that as it may, in the short term and medium term, we still have an obesity problem and we still have an issue like with what people buy. I don't think a short term experiment is probably going to solve these things. And that's the sort of the disappointing part of our paper. The conclusive finding is building a supermarket isn't going to do much in the next few years. Um, and I don't know what would happen if building a supermarket, what, I don't know what it would do over 10 years. Sadly, the people running these subsidies don't actually think of these as experiments and don't collect data. So we just don't have a good source to know if building supermarkets will eventually have, a, have an effect. I'm somewhat skeptical. Any other long run, is there any evidence anywhere in your lit review of this takes time? So yeah, well, just again, preferences like, you know, that people's preferences take a long time to form. It takes, was a linguistics literature has found, it takes seven years to master a language, right? You know, things like, and, and then similarly, I, I've done some work that shows that the half-life of a brand experience can be like 50 years, which means if I grow up eating a certain kind of, you know, buying a certain brand or eating a certain kind of food, that's going to have a lasting effect on me, right? Where that's the way our, that's the way our preferences and skills and things, these things take a long time to form. So if I'm eating a bad, eating badly now, it's going to take a lot to overcome that, uh, that habit, so to speak. And if you are going to try and retrain, it's going to take a while before my habit will change. Uh, thank you. I noticed two things in your paper, um, education in general and education specifically in nutrition. And then your proposal was something with the low income, like uh, women, infants, children's uh, cards. If somebody's buying food, the best place for the education is probably right at the food. And I have no idea how to implement it, but I can imagine stickers on the store shelves, healthy in big letters and WIC for the people that are needing it and getting it. 
and maybe uh, small posters near the food. You can buy more fo food on this program if you buy this also or this instead. Yeah, so there was a company called Nuval a few years ago. It was started by some Yale medical, um, medical school faculty. And what Nuval did was assign products a score between zero and 100. It's, it's a little bit like the HEI actually. And I think Kroger's was one of the supermarket chains that contracted with them. And they did exactly that for a while. They would put Nuval scores on the shelves. And so we, a few years ago, I had a PhD student try and do a couple of case studies where we knew there was new, when there was and when there wasn't Nuval scores and they had no effect. Right? So we couldn't find any effect of the Nuval scores on people's choices. Uh, moreover, Nuval scores aren't on the shelves anymore, which lead me to think the supermarkets also didn't feel these had any effect. The bottom line is it's not enough to just tell people it's healthy because when they eat the product, they don't like it. And you have to develop a taste for it. It actually takes a long time to develop a preference for vegetables. This is why you feed your kids vegetables, right? And over time, eventually they'll start to like them, but no kid likes vegetables when they first eat vegetables. They would much rather eat bagel dogs, right? And you know that's why, if anything, the only thing I think I would be willing to say is a policy that's somewhat education related, because I didn't really have a smoking gun evidence that education is the source of the problem, it's just associated with the problem. But my only public, my only policy I would feel strongly about is it should be targeted towards young people. It is much easier to train young people than to train older people because our habits are already formed. I was like, was it? It was Lenin who said, "Give me kids when they're get, give me the kids, and I'll have them as my slaves for life." Right? Yeah. yeah. You got an old person here. Uh, I'm curious if you look at uh, fast food in different communities versus, you know how many McDonald's there are versus how many supermarkets and what's going on because it's junk but it tastes good yeah that is the biggest that's the biggest missing piece from the study we did is we only have take what we would call the, the take-home market so it's what you buy in grocery and of course what we don't know is how much of people's budgets are going to fast food so if anything I might actually be understating the the nutrition income gap uh, if, if, in fact, grocery is only a small part of how people in low-income neighborhoods spend their money on food. I'm in the process of getting a new data set from a company that's called New... Um, um, oh, what's it, something IQ? No, I can't, no, I can't think of the name of the company. It doesn't matter. It's a little bit like the database we had. But in addition to tracking what their households are buying in stores, they also track their away-from-home consumption. And so I'm really, I'm really eager to get those data and see what happens if I redo an analysis like this but where I also observe how much spending you're doing away from home. And so I'm going to try and get things like, you know, spending on spending in restaurants would be one of them, but also just getting a bigger idea of like what your budget's going to overall, like, you know, how much money are you spending going to the movies? How much money are you spending on other kinds of activities to really not just get an idea of how you're eating, but how important your, your food spending is as a fraction of your budget. I mean, in economics, there's a very long literature going back to the 1800s that says that the propensity to spend your money on food actually declines as your income goes up. So low-income neighborhoods are probably, in theory, should be spending a lot of their budget on food compared to high income. And I'd like to see, besides what kind of food you buy, what would happen to the rest of your budget if I started encouraging you to spend more and buy healthier items? You know, To the extent you are buying more salad and this does increase your prices, relative to McDonald's, for example, right? Um, what would have to give? Because you wouldn't want to have an unintended consequence where, you know, okay, so I'm buying healthier food, but, you know, now I'm not, you know, now I'm not doing some other thing with my money that was also really important, right? Like, for example, now I'm not getting as much babysitting time for my kids and I can't go to, I can't work as long. Thank you. So these are, these are things I want to get at. Thank you. Thank you. It's really interesting. I, uh, in the 90s, uh, my family decided to cut out added sugars and things like that. And it took quite a while of conscious choice before our palate was satisfied with natural sweetened, uh, you know, fruit and uh, tastes like that. Um, at the same time, Whole Foods was beginning to... Uh, become a bigger uh, store in the Chicago area. And they also had, um, at that time, uh, cooking classes and things associated, you know, that helped promote healthier eating. I didn't really participate in those, but Whole Foods has continued to do that. They continue to uh, 
uh, become bigger and bigger. Now they're part of Amazon. So no telling what's going to happen. Um, education takes many different, um, is, is done in different ways. Some is advertising. Some is uh, at the store level, which I, I agree that the, uh, just the signage healthy usually means doesn't taste good. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you're shopping, um, I, I just, I just wonder about the whole education aspect, um, advertising being one of them. And, um, also the entire, uh, effect of the sugar industry and how that may have affected, uh, all of this from way back. So the, it's kind of a question, kind of a statement. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's been a lot of misinformation for sure. The sugar industry sponsored a lot of the research demonizing fat, right? That's, yeah. that, that's a fact. No, you're absolutely right. Um, what does education mean? And, you know, if, if anything, I've been a little dismissive. I don't think just making people aware of healthier options is probably going to have much of an effect in the shorter medium run. Um, it's more about what to do. I mean, eating healthy is not just about what you buy. Once you buy these healthy ingredients, you then have to assemble them into a thing called dinner. And, you know, one of our, Niels and my former colleagues, Gary Becker, had a whole had a whole literature that he not only did he he spawned this literature but he actually made a lot of the biggest contributions to it throughout its lifetime and that was the the whole idea of household production theory that once upon a time you know you went to the store to buy all of the raw materials and then you went home and you used your knowledge to you to transform all those materials into a thing called dinner right we made stuff at home right and what the CPG industry has done is supplied us with convenience. We no longer need that household technology because instead you can buy a ready to eat meal. You just take this ready to eat meal, you take it out of the freezer, you put it in the microwave, right? Or you, even worse, it's shelf stable. You take it off the shelf, right? It hasn't even been refrigerated or frozen, right? And you just eat it or it comes out of a can, right? And so we've lost these skills. I mean, household production theory has almost been entirely outsourced in the, in this, you know, especially in the latter part of the 20th century. And part of education is telling people maybe that convenience came at a cost. It saved us time, right? It may have also saved us money because these were cheap solutions, but it came at a cost. We're paying for it in health units of health. And so we need to retrain people how to cook stuff. We need to retrain people, not just how to shop, but how to assemble a meal and how to assemble uh, an array or a sequence of meals throughout the day and throughout the week. And you, you mentioned whole foods. That's certainly something that people were able to do especially in a single income family where somebody has the time to run the household economy, which includes buying the raw materials and then applying their human capital to make meals. But it may be harder to do in a dual income family you know, or in a neighborhood where people just don't have that much time to go and learn how to cook. Yeah. Okay. I've got two more from uh, the YouTube. Um, so one of these may be past your domain knowledge, but I'll ask it anyway. So it says an emerging idea in health policy is that emphasis on obesity maybe overstates the full range of health risks that people face, that the, the people in these uh, lower income neighborhoods have lots of other disadvantages, you know, bad air quality, lack of green space, and, and all kinds of other things. And do you think that, I don't know if you've read much as to whether or not the fact that obesity is so visible and obvious means that we're perhaps um, spending too much effort trying to deal with that as opposed to these longer term risks that, you know, grow over your lifetime as well. So if you've got anything to say about that, and the second one's a little bit snarky, but it says, do we know anything about whether wealthy people use new stores in the food deserts to avoid crowds in their uh, home neighborhoods? Hey, that's a that's an interesting question. So Whole Foods, with a lot of pomp and ceremony, opened a store in Englewood a few years ago. I've never actually been in that store, um, but but I you know it's it, it, two things. Number one, it doesn't look like a Whole Foods. Like if you go to the Whole Foods on Kingsbury up on Willow Road, uh, I don't. I'm told that the one in in Englewood doesn't look anything like those stores. So it says Whole Foods. It does have does have some of their their private label organic and all of that, but it definitely has a very different assortment. Um, it's hard not to conclude that this was a PR move, right? And I do work with Amazon. I, do, I hope that I'd like to think that the stuff I'm working on is for good, not for bad. Um, so I mean, I'm sure they wouldn't. They would immediately be. They wouldn't agree with me on that. But it seemed like a PR move to me more than anything else. Um, I don't have any reason to think that people are driving a long way to avoid lines to go there. Um, so, I, but I, the truth is, I just don't know. Uh, the other question you had was uh, what was this? Well, sorry, obesity. Obesity. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the, the 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 short and honest response to that is is for me just to say, yeah, I didn't think that the study I had here was going to be the all encompassing solution to, to America's health problem and the burden on the healthcare system. This is just one small piece. I use the obesity facts as more as a motivation <clears throat> for why I think studying nutritional inequality is interesting and why and it's why it's policy relevant. And then me, mostly is to try and show that our leading our pet our conventional wisdom and our pet theory for why there's nutritional inequality is probably wrong. Um, and that we're wasting a lot of money on 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 solutions that are probably aren't going to do much. Um, but whether or not this is the only cause of obesity, and whether or not focusing on obesity is really going to make society a better place, I, that's sort of like outside my domain. I don't know if we could make everyone not be obese. It seems like it would definitely reduce healthcare costs. But there are lots of other things that I would associate more with social justice as being problems, and they may be bigger problems. I just don't know. Time for three more questions. Okay. Um, thank you for your talk. Can you say a little bit more about uh, what the food desert situation is in Chicago right now? Of like 55% of people in low income uh, zip codes kind of being in a food desert it seems pretty high. I guess I could still see people saying, yeah, there's, there's still, they still are food deserts and maybe um, not having, you know, those stores there at all still contributes to it. Have those subsidies actually, we know the Whole Foods example, but have they actually placed more grocery stores in those neighborhoods? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I looked at, that was what my case studies were. I have 7,000 almost yeah. supermarkets that entered. And in the paper, I first say, just on average, what happens when you put a supermarket? But remember I had that second, that whole separate column on the right, which says, let's now just focus on the subset of those stores. I just forget how many they were, but it was in the thousands that were specifically in the things we would call call food deserts, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer is not much happens. People shop in them, right? You put a supermarket into a food desert and people will shop there. And that's not surprising because I also showed you even when there wasn't a supermarket, people were shopping in supermarkets. They just had to go five or six miles. Mm -hmm. So maybe now I only have to go to a mile to shop. And so that's great. It's convenient, saves me time, but I'm still buying the same junk instead of buying healthier foods. And it's not surprising because I wasn't constrained. I already had access to availability. You know, I was going to a Walmart super center. It was really far away and it had all these healthy options. I just didn't pick them. Now I only drive a mile and I'm still not picking them. So can we say that the issue of food deserts has declined, uh, yet people are still making the same choices? Yeah. I, okay. So now, so this is a related question is how many food deserts are left? And the answer right. is lots of them, right? I mean, the, the HF... Uh, a billion and a half dollars isn't going to launch that many supermarkets, right? Because remember, it's not just it's not just covering the opening cost. It has to be sustainable, and the supermarket has to be able to survive. And the operating cost of having this big physical space and a staff of people in it every day, I mean, is really expensive, right? So a billion dollars isn't going to give you a whole lot of supermarkets. Yeah. Or two billion won't give you a whole lot of supermarkets. So there's plenty of food deserts left in the U.S. Okay. And the majority of them, by the way, are in rural areas. They're not actually, I mean, we tend to think of food deserts as an inner city problem, but it's actually much more prevalent in the rural areas. And it's, and it's, not, and it's not predominantly um, ethnic minority. There is a lot of all white food deserts as well, and a lot of obesity problems in these all white food deserts. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. That, that connects to, to my question, which is, um, I was wondering if you could say anything about uh, international comparisons in, in terms of uh, like health inequities across income groups, um, both in say countries more similar to the US and also poorer countries. And then maybe more to your data, um, whether are, there are any differences across different parts of the US, either different regions like South versus North versus West or rural urban, which you, you were touching on. Yeah, so in my, my own work, we didn't really try and see if food deserts were concentrated more in areas, some areas than others. We didn't get into the geography of food deserts. We were just, we we're kind of more focused on what happens on average in certain neighborhoods or certain house social economic groups, as opposed to certain geographic areas. So I don't really know the answer to that, but certainly <clears throat> nutrition inequality was a, is considered a very big problem in the UK. And they are actually ahead of us, ahead of the US and actually tackling that problem. They formed that social exclusion unit. And that's where the term came from. But you go to developing countries like India, for example, and nutritional inequality is much starker than it is here, um, which reminds me of a study. And this comes back to some of the questions people had on information treatments and changing people's behavior. 
There's a wonderful study in India of labor of, of um, working class migrants in India, and this is contemporaneous work. This wasn't historic. <clears throat> um, looking at people who are very much migrant labor moving from neighbor areas, one area of India to another. And what you have in India, because there's a lot of differences in geography and geology and climate, you have areas that are better for certain kinds of crops. And what they would find is you grow up in an area where it's really amenable to, you know, you have a lot of moisture, so you grow a lot of rice and you have a very heavy rice protein diet and you move to an area and that is part of the country, which is more prone to something like corn. And you'll see that you're still eating a lot of rice, even though the area you've moved to corn is a lot cheaper to produce. So you're actually, if you're really low income, you're literally depriving yourselves of calories because you're still eating the rice you grew up with, even though you could be getting the same calories from corn at a much lower price it shows you that even when my, when my calories are on the line, I still don't adapt, right? This is this, this Atkins study, which I think is fascinating, right? So people are incredibly persistent in their preferences. Um, and so in India, and this, tying this back to your question is, yeah, in India, it's even more striking the nutritional inequality and that people are literally depriving themselves of calories in this instant by insisting on buying the wrong nutrient. You could have gotten the same nutrient for, at a lower price or the same calorific intake rather at a lower price. This will be the last one. Sure. So you're obviously really interested in the economics of what we eat and drink. How did you become interested in this field? Oh, that's a great question. So I'm, I'm, in mar I'm actually a marketing professor. Um, a lot of, I mean, even, I think even Anil at some point or others had questions like, what is it exactly you guys do and why, why is it interesting? Um, I'm not sure if Anil remembers this, but my work on brand history started with a lunch conversation where you, you and some others asked me, this is when I was an assistant professor and I'd never been so nervous in my life. And you said, in, you know, tell me what the big questions are in marketing. And then, you know, I'm trying to go, you know, and why would somebody in economics care about this, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so we got into the topics of brands, right? And I said, brands, and like, and, and I remember you saying, like, why, who cares about brands, right? And, and so I went back and thought about this. And so I, at the time, had been just starting to draw these maps and finding these brand reads. And I'm like, well, I think the answer must be that it seems like there are brand markets, right? And, and then I started seeing, like, people are paying a price premium for Coke in one city, and Coke's really popular. Why is... Coke more popular and more expensive here, but not somewhere else. I mean, you'd think Coke is Coke. I can't think about why Coke would be different when I'm in the West Coast versus the East Coast, and yet there's a huge difference in what people are paying for it and how many people are paying for it. And so then I got into this whole thing on brands and learning on how people form brand preferences and then trying to show folks like Anil <laughs> that brand preferences are really important for understanding how markets work, that we have incredibly concentrated consumer markets and brands are at the heart of that concentration, that uh, brands and brand history help us understand that. And that sort of sort of segue then into, well, what are people consuming and is it good for them? Are these brands actually good or bad for you? And sadly, I'm slowly concluding some of these brands are really bad for us and we're forming bad eating habits. And that was the next step then into what are our preferences for nutrients? All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neil. <laughs>
Secretive, intimidating, shrewd, and power hungry, Mad Madigan mesmerizes his admirers and often loves his opponents too beaten down to oppose him. The author vividly recreates the battles that define the Madigan era from the stunning James Thompson, uh, from stunning James Thompson with the lightning strike tax increased, pressing for a pension overhaul that ultimately failed in the courts, and to steering the House toward the Blagojevich impeachment. Long also examines the machinery that kept the speaker in power. For more details on upcoming Sunday programs and other activities, see our website, again, ethicalhumanistsociety.org. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel for past videos of, uh, of uh, previous programs. Um, let me offer some closing words. Um, and so that my closing quote will be an old English proverb. Don't dig your own grave with your own knife and fork. Um, delayed lag there, okay. Um, all right, so th that concludes our program. Um, we give you 10 minutes to collect your stuff and then we're gonna resume our happy hour, or happy hour, coffee hour. <laughs> happy to see each other hour. <laughs> um, it, it will be mask optional. Uh, so you're, you're welcome to stay in this auditorium, uh, say 10 minutes from now. And uh, if uh, you don't wanna participate in this uh, maskless, and you can keep your mask on if you care to. Uh, but if you don't want to participate, you, you've got some time to go ahead and uh, collect your gear and get out. And uh, we'll see you next week. And the program committee will meet upstairs. Bye.